Greetings everyone, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here and you enjoy horror stories, consider clicking subscribe down below. Can we get 400 likes on today's video? I am your channel host commentator, let's get into this. My name's John, I'm 35 years old with 3 kids. This is the story of how I gave myself PTSD. On the summer of 2017, I decided that I'd rent out my Ram pickup truck. It was a grey one, a relatively new one, only a few years old. You're probably wondering why I wanted to do this, well I didn't want to, but I needed to. You see at the time I was working full time and my wife had fallen ill, so she got made redundant from her job. As a result, I then had to do a lot of work and take on extra shifts. Even the extra shifts weren't adding up and at the end of each month we were falling short. We were already in debt with credit cards and different loans, so that was when my cousin gave the idea of renting out my RAM on Craigslist, saying that I could charge up to $100 a day just for guys to go and use it for handiwork and what not. It seemed like a great idea and I was ready to jump at anything at this point because we were getting so desperate. I had never used Craigslist in my life, I hadn't even gone to look on it. Now I know that's hard to believe, at the time of this happening I was 30 years old. But I just never used it, I was never a guy to buy or sell things online, if I wanted something I'd go down the store and buy it brand new. I didn't like the idea of getting involved with strangers, wrongins as my gran used to call them. Well, here I was, with my cousin around the house and my wife tucked up in bed, coughing all over the place. He was trying to show me how to set up the account and post the advert. Once my cousin had set up the account, we were in the process of writing the advert, I hopped outside and reversed the ram out of the garage. I took a couple pictures using my phone in landscape mode and then uploaded them to the advert. I have to admit that my cousin was a godsend in this situation and it was him that came up with this idea. I call him a godsend now, but in reality, it was more of a nightmare send. So as soon as we post the ad, many people, I'm talking probably 50 within the first 24 hours, started pouring into the inbox. I didn't know what to do, so I ring up my cousin and ask him, what should I do? Sounded kinda dumb and he laughed at me on the other side of the line, saying, well look at it goddamn. Look through the people, pick the one you want. So I proceed to just sift through all these people. I'll be honest, I just couldn't pick which one. It was just brain numbing going through all these people as they all pretty much had the same supposed reasons for wanting to use the pickup. Work, transporting things, etc. The whole reason I'd got on here was for the money and I couldn't really give a crap as to what they used the vehicle for. So I contact my cousin again, telling him that I was just going to do a random choice. Basically sift through the messages, shut my eyes and point at the screen of my laptop. So that's exactly what I did. During that evening, fate chose me to point upon a man whose account was Dave189. The account's no longer active on Craigslist, so I figured I could use that and just publicly say it. But Dave189 asked me to use the pickup, the RAM, because he needed to transport some bricks to his friend's building site. Those were almost his exact words. Well, I got back to him replying to his message, saying that he could come round and grab it whenever he wanted. I drove to work in my wife's Honda because at the time she was so ill. Also, I could have just taken public transport, or even cycled. Didn't like the idea of that though. Well, I needed the extra money, and a hundred bucks every day was definitely worth having to cycle to work. So, there I was. This guy was on my drive taking a look at the truck. He looked like your typical worker, like a construction site worker, builder type, 
He was tall, with a huge goatee and moustache. He had a hard hat on and turned up wearing high vis. He had dirty, coal-like hands, so I mean, he couldn't really go wrong with the whole builder look. It was the look, and I have to be honest. This guy looked like he had already done a hard day's work and it was only 8 o'clock in the morning. We stood there on the drive for a few more minutes and I explained some simple things about the ram, the features, how to do it, how to open the doors. I basically treated this guy as if he was dumb. Now, I didn't mention that I had actually fitted the ram with a GPS. I'd hidden the GPS in the interior of the back seats, so unless he stripped it completely down, which would be illegal, then he would actually not find the GPS. The whole reason I put the GPS in in the first place was because my cousin told me to. He said it was a must in case they try and steal the truck. Some people can give false details and then try to run off, he said. So I thought it was a good idea. The GPS wasn't huge amounts of money and it meant that I could now track the truck on my phone. The guy wanted to hire the truck for four days. He said that he would be using it to transport the bricks, as I said earlier, and he told me that in the chat of the Craigslist. After this, it was kind of a weird interaction. He didn't really talk much, but he was quite blunt and to the point. It's kind of like talking to a human robot. So he would just talk facts. Kind of reminds me of Elon. You know, the Musk guy. Well, in reality, I was just happy to have my first customer rent out the RAM. He gave me the cash in hand up front, so I was almost certain he wasn't going to try and scam me, but he did have the truck. There was a security deposit as well, which you had to pay before you turned up. I can't remember what that was now, but it was just under two grand, in case you damaged it. You also had to prove to me that you had insurance. That was a big one too, didn't want the thing getting clamped by the police or towed away. Cash in hand, deposit paid, and him figuring out how to drive the thing off my drive. I walked back inside my house and waved him farewell, praying to God that he would bring the thing back in four days time without scratches, dents. Well, I just hoped he'd bring it back. I had my doubts about using this on Craigslist and having my truck rented out, but my cousin said if I was desperate for money, it was a good option. With that, he drove away, and I went inside the house. I sat down, and a few hours pass, and my curiosity gets the better of me. I pull open my phone and go on the app to track the GPS. He's driven it around three miles away downtown, and it's parked up on a road, a busy residential suburban one. I can't see exactly which house it's in, as the GPS wasn't one of those really expensive ones, so I guess it didn't give the exact area. But I knew which road he was in, and whereabouts on that road. Not to a pinpoint though. After checking, then I just kind of brush it off. I thought in my mind maybe it was his house, or his friend's house, or even the building site where he was delivering the bricks. I put my phone down and enjoyed the rest of the evening with my family, I had to do a bunch of the cooking because my wife just couldn't, she was so ill. I'll be honest, I didn't do much cooking. I did a bunch of ordering takeaways and food to the house, but I did occasionally cook some food, even though it was terrible, according to my wife. The next day, I wake up and again, I'm curious, so I open up the app to take a look at where the GPS is. Now, the good thing about this GPS and the app was that it tracked history in real time, so it recorded where the car had been. Now, it came up with a small icon of a car, like a cartoon on the map. There had been loads of activity between the hours of 2 and 4 in the morning. I thought to myself, what kind of activity could they be doing at that time? No one transports bricks at 2 o'clock in the morning. Right, I was a bit confused, and I guess he had every right to do what he wanted with that truck, within reason. But I was just really, really, I don't know, none of it made sense. So as you could imagine, I started worrying and I called up my cousin immediately. 
He said there's nothing I can really do. Obviously the tracker was just if he stole it and never returned, not to just stalk him on his activity when he's actually rented it out. So I just agreed with my cousin and said yeah, that's true. So eventually I go about my day and another whole day passes. The evening of the second day arrives and I'm absolutely exhausted, once again a full day's work with extra hours and then cooking for the kids. Eventually I get to bed and when I wake up in the next morning I check the GPS activity. Without fault, again, 2 to 4 o'clock in the morning, the exact same activity. The car seemed to be going between the house that it had got to on the first night and another house around a mile away. It kept doing trips there and back, 6, 7, sometimes 8 times a night. Then it would go back to the original house, park up and stay there until around 8 in the morning. None of these movements made sense. What should have been peak times for a builder or construction worker, the truck wasn't moving at all. Instead, the most activity was tracked between 2 and 4 in the morning. At the end of the 4 day period, the guy had arranged that he would bring it back at the same time he came to collect it. So between around 7 and 8 in the morning. I woke up that morning happy that I'd finally get the truck back, but also suspicious as to what he had been doing. I figured I wouldn't even ask and I would just take the truck and give it a quick check over for any dents or, well, scratch marks before he left. Then the point was if there was no marks that I could prove, then he would get the security deposit back. I got up real early, excited to finally have my ram back and be able to stop having to take the bus to work. I got out on my drive at about half seven and just put up a little chair to sit there. I cracked open a nice cold beer. My kids had a day off, I can't remember why, but I think it was a holiday. Anyway, they were just chilling in the beds as you can imagine, still asleep, lazy teenagers, and I was out drinking my cold beer waiting for this guy to drive up my drive with the ram. While the clock hit 8 and he still wasn't there, the clock hit 8.30, no sign. The clock hit 9, still no sign. At this point I got through two beers and stopped myself from having a third. I go back into the house and wake my son up, explaining that I'm probably going to go and try and find where this truck is. First, I gave the number a call as we had exchanged our numbers before he took the truck away. He wasn't answering at all, and in fact, the number wasn't even dialing as if he had blocked my number. That's when I pulled out open the app again and found that the truck was now 10 miles away on the edge of a national park. Yes, on the edge of a national park. What the hell was he doing there? I call my cousin who came straight over and we hop into his truck and follow it. The same activity happened on the last night too, to and from the house a mile away, seven times between the times of two and four in the morning. But at five in the morning, the truck had been driven to the edge of the national park, nine miles from his house and ten from mine, and left, till now, where it was around ten, ten thirty. We were in the truck of my cousin, and we were heading to it. Eventually we found the truck. It was in almost pristine condition. It even looked like the guy had cleaned it, inside and out. Except, when I got in the truck, I noticed there was an unusual smell. I unlocked the ram with the spare keys I had. I figured the guy didn't want his security deposit then. The two grand he gave me a few days back. Well, other than the smell, there was nothing really wrong with it. It was hard to describe the smell, it was like an earthy, mouldy type smell, but it looked like he had made an effort to clean the whole thing once again. It was cleaner than I had left it for him. I drove back with my cousin following behind. This guy still had a pair of keys and he knew where I lived, which really played on my mind for the drive back. Well, eventually, when I get back up my drive, 
My cousin says that I should give it one last check over, checking the trunk and all the little coves, and the side parts and the glove boxes. So that's what I do. I go round and I shine a light at the hard to see areas, and I pick out the GPS tracker. I strip down one section of it, and then I realise something. The smell was coming from the glove box. When I open up the glove box, I was met by a sight of a human finger covered in blood. This human finger had a pink nail attached to it, and looked to be the finger of a lady. Immediately I began throwing up all over my own truck, and my cousin comes running round asking what the hell's going on. I point to the glove box and he too goes over and starts gagging. There was a human finger in the glove box, and I did not put that there. We call the police immediately, and I give as many details as I can regarding this Dave guy. His Craigslist account had been deleted as of that morning, and other than the address that he had the truck parked up on, I had nothing else to go by. I showed the officers the history of how he had been driving the ram with the GPS on it. They managed to track him down at his home address, and after a long investigation, they found that the house he was visiting between 2 and 4 was his ex-wife. They would got into arguments every night and he tried to get her back. It got so bad that he ended up sedating her, murdering her, chopping up her body, and then burying it in the national park. All the while using my ram pickup. I'd been looking for a reasonably priced laptop on Craigslist for about a week now. The problem seemed to be either they were too expensive, or they were too low a spec for what I needed. The reason I needed one was 10 days prior, I had been in my local park, which is Hollenbeck, in Los Angeles. I had been doing college work, sitting on a bench under one of the trees to give the screen some shade. I often sat on this bench when I had some free time to work away from the class. Because it intended to be quieter, then, well, than other parts of the park. On this day, I was happily working away, when a guy walked past in front of me, and started to slow, and then started coughing over and over again. He then grabbed his chest, and slowly went down onto his knees, and then leant onto his hands, still coughing. I can't breathe, he yells out, please can you hit my back, hurry. I shot up from the bench, and went to help. When I got there, I started to pat his back quite hard, and after a couple of minutes, he seemed to stop coughing, and his breathing was a lot better. I asked if he wanted to call an ambulance, but he said no. Then, he proceeded to walk off after thanking me. I returned to my seat and sat down. I looked down on the seat where I'd left my laptop, and immediately saw that it was gone. I straight away checked the floor area in case I'd knocked it off the bench. No, it had been taken. Then it dawned on me, the guy having the supposed breathing attack, was most likely the distraction, while his accomplice must have come from behind while I was helping, and Dan was stolen it. How had I been so stupid, and even more stupid was that I never bothered to insure my laptop, so I was stuffed. So this was why I was looking over Craigslist to try and find a Dell 17 inch laptop with an i7 processor to replace it. It was Friday night and I was wading through the ads and suddenly there was one, a Dell 17 inch laptop with an i7 processor, voila. I messaged the seller and arranged to go and see the laptop on Saturday morning. The seller gave me an address in the Brooklyn Heights district, and we arranged a time of 11.30 to meet up. The seller gave his name as Oliver. I arrived at his house at 11.25 and went to the door and rang the bell. I heard someone approach the other side of the door and call out, Who is it? I reply back, It's William. I am here to see Oliver about the Dell laptop he's selling on Craigslist. The next thing I hear is loads of locks being cleared, 
and the door then opens to reveal a large framed guy wearing a black top. He had dark jeans on and wrapped round sunglasses. He then pointed to a chair in the right side of the room and said you sit down on that chair over there and don't touch anything, understand? I nodded, I certainly was not going to argue with this guy. Well it turns out this guy wasn't in fact Oliver, as the man walks out of the room, he then says Oliver will see you shortly. I made my way to the chair and sat down, as I looked around it suddenly struck me. The whole room had lots of computers and phone tech items on the floor, some were laid out on tables as well. As I looked around I saw another couple of guys like me sitting on chairs in the other side of the room. One guy sitting had a man standing close by him showing him some sort of laptop. I then heard the man standing raise his voice and say, that's the price, there's no discussion on it, I think it's time you leave. He then indicated to the guy on the door by clicking his fingers. The man came over immediately and virtually lifted him off his seat and said, you're out of here buddy, and marched him to the door and then threw it. He then closed and locked it behind him. What the hell was I in? some kind of laptop dealing den. The man that had been talking to the guy who got thrown out, then crossed the floor and stood in front of me and introduced himself as Oliver. He said I believe you've come to see the Dell computer with the i7 processor. I said yes. He turned around and started looking about the room behind me saying give me a minute and I'll have a look and bring it over on the table over there. Oliver was about 6 foot tall and had shoulder length hair. He returned several minutes later and placed the laptop on the table. He said there were a few minor scratches but that's all, all the old data had been cleared so she's ready to go, take a look he said. I checked it over and everything looked good. Then suddenly I noticed a small scratch on the lower half of the right side of the screen. Then it dawned on me, this was my stolen laptop. It had the exact same mark on the screen and as I turned it over I saw the last three digits of the serial number were 007, which I always remembered as mine. Oliver interrupts my shock saying, alright, you look like you've just seen a ghost, what's wrong mate? I had to think fast, I thought I must not give it away that I'm the owner of this laptop. Uh, no it's all fine, I said, trying to remain calm. Oliver then said, you know the price, that's what I expect, have you got the cash? Yes, I said, I handed over the cash and as I did, so he said, have we met before? You look familiar. No, I said, then I realised Oliver was the man who had tricked me in the park with his breathing issue while behind me my laptop was being stolen. I paid the money and left as soon as I got in my car. I immediately drove to the police station and told them what had occurred. They raided the place and found out that all the equipment in the building was stolen and that they had been advertising it all on Craigslist, listed for cash sales only. Both of them were found guilty of theft and selling stolen property. They were sent to jail. There was something so eerie and chilling about having him ask do I know you. The look in his eyes I knew he couldn't quite remember, but if he had, dear god what would he have done to me. I ended up paying for my own stolen laptop and the reality was that the police managed to get the money back and allocate me what was rightfully mine. The truth remains that these people were some kind of a gang and that they were operating by stealing gadgets and different things and reselling them on through Craigslist, trying their hardest not to leave a single trace. It turns out that I was the candidate where their luck would run out. The chances of this happening were probably 1 in 10 or 20 million but the fact they did happen mean it saved a whole bunch of other people a lot of harm, loss and unnecessary pain. 
After this, their operation was shut down, and it made them a predicted $400,000 in the space of a few months that they were doing it. So yeah, keep your eye out next time someone tries to ask for help, and you have valuables around that you maybe have to take your eyes off to help that person. It may be Oliver. My grandfather had been flying planes since he was around 18 years old. I'd always gone to the airport at the weekends to watch him have his lessons. It was kind of weird because he would have lessons even though he had been flying for 30 odd years. Well, he took a long break from flying when he was 21 and then got back into it when he was around 50, 51. Well, I decided that I wanted to try it. It looked fun, and he had a couple videos of him up flying. Eventually, he recommended that I take a look at some planes. You see, I had a high paying job, and he was willing to also help me out a bit. He recommended a Cessna 172. So, we looked on Craigslist to try and find some for sale. There were some people at the airport that were selling some, but they were far too out of our price range. They were some of the newer models, and our idea was ones maybe around 150, 120, depending on what the service history was, and whether it was actually safe. I did find it kind of daunting, the idea of buying a plane off someone, praying that they had taken care of it, otherwise you don't know what might happen when you're up there in the air. So bear in mind, as I was scrolling through Craigslist, my granddad was the one with all of the experience. I had only ever been on flights to holiday on 747s, so I didn't know what it was going to feel like being in a tiny plane. We managed to get a couple contacts, and there was a guy at the flying club. His name was Pete, and he recommended us to a guy called George. Apparently George was trying to sell his Cessna 172, and he connected us. George did actually have an ad up on Craigslist at the time. He had an ad on virtually every site he could possibly get one on. He needed to sell it quite fast, because he had come onto hard times and needed the money. He was trying to liquidate six figures to help him pay off some loans, well, that's what he told my granddad. My granddad was quite close to everyone at the flying school, and he had done helping out seasons with some of the youth pilots. So you didn't mess with my granddad, or scam him, that was for sure. I knew we were getting the proper thing, the legit plane. But there was one thing my granddad said. He told him that he wanted to do a test flight first, with me in the plane as well. Well, it was kind of exciting, the thought of going up there in the first time, the plane that I'd be buying, and have it as my very own to start lessons in. We turn up and agree to meet at a set time. We pick the time with the less congestion and traffic, obviously, for safer routes. We just plan to do a couple routes around the area and the town, and then head out and back. So, everything's fine, we get our gear on, I put the headset on, me and my granddad are sat behind the guy who's flying the plane. I have to say, it feels nothing like a proper 747, or any of the uh, commercial airline jets. It feels like you're literally flying through the air, in nothing but a piece of plastic. The plane is so light, and every bit of turbulence and wind, it bounces slightly up and down. It was exhilarating, and fun, but also it felt like you were living on the edge of it, with a huge sense of danger. Well, we got given the old clear from traffic control. He takes off, and we're in the air smoothly. It was clean, a nice fresh day out, not very many clouds, but also the wind was around 10-15 miles per hour. Once George had stabilised everything, my granddad reached over and tapped him on his left shoulder. George turns around, glancing back at us. My granddad gives him the thumbs up, saying nice smooth takeoff lad, great job. Then we start talking about how good the weather is. It's quite cool, but it's a rather tight atmosphere in that little plane. If you didn't have the headset on, there's no way I could heard a single word they're saying. 
It was so loud in there that you needed the headphones. Well, we get flying and start doing a touch of sightseeing. It just so happened that this was the Orlando airport, so there was lots to see all around us. Once we started doing a few out and backs, we decided to detour slightly. We ended up making the trip a bit longer than usual, and George asked me to come and sit at the front and he showed me a couple of the controls. You see, I hadn't even had one lesson at this point, so I had no clue. It was like looking like a bunch of buttons, uh, well, millions of them to be totally honest, and I had no idea what to even press or do. At one point, George offered me to take over, and I immediately shook my head, thinking, no, this isn't going to happen, mate. So he realised when my granddad told him that I hadn't even had my first lesson yet, let alone a taster session, so it probably wasn't best to let me try flying the plane just yet. Although my granddad was trained to be a teacher and instructor, he didn't like the idea of me trying it while we were only there to simply test out the plane, not my skills. So we must have been around 20 minutes into the flight at this point and we made the decision to turn round. As we were turning the plane round, I realised just how surreal everything was. I had a WTF moment just looking at all the houses and everything below me. It was incredible. But the next thing I realise, George has his head on the stick. Yes, he's got his head on it. And at first I thought he was joking, so I started just chuckling to myself. But then I look over and realise that he isn't. The dude has passed out while flying the plane. Panic started to hit me so hard that I thought I was going to die there and then. My granddad quickly grabbed George, pulled him back by his shoulders from behind and leaned him back on the chair. Then he undid his straps and got him out of the seat, bringing him behind the two front seats and laying him down. After that, I told my granddad to take control of the plane while I'd somewhat try to figure out what was going on with George. I put him in the recovery position and tried to check his airways were open. Yes, he was breathing. Yes, he had a pulse. Thank God. Now, my granddad just had to land the plane, but we're around 10 minutes from the airport. So I didn't know what to do at this point other than keep him in the recovery position. Every once in a while he would cough, but he wasn't fitting, he wasn't shaking, and he wasn't going hard or having contractions. He wasn't vomiting or hyperventilating. It was really weird. It was like he had just passed out of something. My granddad was worried, I could tell. This was his first time flying the plane, and even the most experienced pilots sometimes get a bit nervous when flying a new plane for the first time. At this point the plane was now turned around. I was at the back with the guy, and my grandfather was now flying the plane. I noticed a huge difference in how it felt, as if he was just going as fast as the plane possibly could go. The engines sounded like they were about to blow up, and I was panicking in the back, thinking that this guy was about to die on me. Well, eventually we made it back, landed safely, and I could hear my granddad talking to the people in the tower, telling them that we had a medical emergency. They cancelled some other takeoffs and gave us free passage for an emergency landing on the main runway. Once we touched down, there was ambulance and medics waiting for us. My granddad made sure everything was switched off safely and put everything back how it was. Then we grabbed a guy and put him over each of our shoulders and carried him out the narrow small door. It was really hard getting out the steps trying to keep hold of this guy who was still unconscious at this point. Eventually the medics took over and brought one of those stretcher things that roll on wheels. Well they pushed him over to the ambulance and run a few tests on him. Initially, they couldn't find out what was wrong. They ran every test possible and he started to gain consciousness once they injected him with some stuff. I have no idea what it was, whether it was some kind of glucose or adrenaline, but he came round and looked super confused. They ended up taking him off to the hospital, and after all this, we did actually buy the plane. The plane itself was in great condition and it flew almost perfectly, 
as shown in this story. Eventually, it turned out that this guy had a huge drop in his blood sugar and found out that he had diabetes. Yeah, what a way to find out. That was a bit of a spook for me, but it didn't put me off flying. After this, I ended up behind the plane two weeks after when he had made a full recovery. They gave him one of those EpiPens and a bunch of other advice to keep his sugar levels up while flying. I think for a while they even told him that he couldn't fly alone because of this happening. Had we have not been there, it would have been fatal. Well, almost certain it would have been. The reality was we saved his life and he offered us a huge discount off the plane as a result which I didn't want to accept, so although I allowed him to knock 20k off, he wanted to knock off half the price of what the plane was worth. Considering he was trying to sell to cover debts, I didn't want to do that. And I like to think any of you listening to this story would also save a fellow man, sister or brother in such a dangerous situation. But if my granddad wasn't there, God knows how I would have landed that plane without a single lesson. If you enjoyed today's video and you like horror stories and listening to them, then consider subscribing to the channel down below. It means a lot and I'm trying to grow this channel. I am one of the most consistent uploading horror story channels on YouTube. If you have any submissions, check the email down below in the description. Also, if you have any uh, thoughts on what you'd like to hear, any different topics of horror stories, also comment them down below. I have been your host commentator and I'll catch you guys in the next one.